There's an old phrase, uh, do you ever feel like you've been caught between the devil and the deep blue sea? Well, in the Israelites' case, it was caught in between Pharaoh and the Red Sea, and God provided a powerful deliverance for them. This is the thesis of a book by Robert Morgan called The Red Sea Rules. I have always had a ministry of giving away books. I've given away thousands of dollars worth of books over the years in ministry. Whenever I saw somebody struggling, and if I had a book that dealt with that concept, teaching God's truth about that particular issue, I would give them a book because I want them to be able to find strength and help in that situation. No other book have I given away more than Red Sea Rules. Red Sea Rules has helped me profoundly in my own life. It's 10 God-given strategies for dealing with the difficult times in life. 10 God-given strategies for dealing with the difficult times in life. And who doesn't have difficult times? I mean, whether it's uh, some workplace issue that seems like it's spiraling out of control or a series of family relationships that make you feel like you're in the middle of some bizarre pinball machine and you're bounced off of one, one issue and then another issue and then another issue, or whether it is just the general chaos and malaise of the days that's creating distress in our life, we find ourselves sometimes trapped and we don't know exactly what to do. So God wants to give us some overarching principles that you and I can apply to our life so that we can have help in the midst of that. But let's, let's work our way through Red Sea Rule number one. Red Sea Rule number one is this. Realize that God means for you to be where you are. Realize that God means for you to be where you are. We sometimes have what uh, I call destination disease. We feel like if somehow I just lived in another state, everything would be better. Somehow if I just had another job, everything would be better. Sometimes, if I just had another wife, everything could be better. If I just had different kids, everything could be better. That's not the reality. The reality is that we are responsible for our own situations. We are are the ones that need to learn specific lessons in the midst of the situations in which we find ourselves. And, and so God uses our circumstances to teach us and to train us. In fact, I would argue that the entirety of the Israelites' journey from Egypt, the land of bondage, to Canaan, the land of promise, is a series of, of valuable lessons that they learned but also it's valuable lessons for us that we can learn so that we can move from bondage to promise. So we can move from uh, feeling trapped to being triumphant. And Red Sea Rules is really about that. So know that God means for you to be where you are and he's going to use your current situation to develop Christ-like character in you as you turn to him and trust in him in the midst of this. Let's read the first few verses of Exodus chapter 14 and see where uh, Robert Morgan gets this concept about the Red Sea rules and that God meant for them to be where they are. In Exodus 14 verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before uh, Philaroth, and between Migdal and the sea, over against uh, Baal, Saffron, that before it shall encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land, and the wilderness hath shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon his host, and the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord, and they did so. Now what's going on is that uh, the tenth and final plague has been unleashed on Egypt and on uh, Pharaoh specifically, the death of the firstborn as the death angel passed over the entire land and any place that didn't have blood on the doorpost, that they, uh, the firstborn died in it. And Pharaoh is, is finally done with the children of Israel, ready to send them away, to get them gone. And they're headed out. And on the way out, Pharaoh changes his mind because he hardens his heart. And he sends his uh, 800 chariots after them to, to kill them in the wilderness because he, he understands that they've come to the border of the Red Sea. They're right on the coast of the Red Sea. They've got a mountain on one side and a mountain on the other side. Strategically, he has them exactly where he wants them. They're trapped. There's nothing they can do. There's nowhere they can go. There are easy pickings for him, and he heads out after them. And God tells them to stop there. God tells them to stop between those two mountains and on the coast of the Red Sea because he wants Pharaoh to come out because he's going to take Pharaoh out. He wants Pharaoh to come out because he's going to take Pharaoh out. 
Sometimes you'll ask God, God, why are you leading me through the deep waters? And he says, child, because your enemies can't swim. And that's exactly what was going on here. God takes us through some deep and trying times because he's going to do something that you don't understand right now. And we don't understand what God is doing. When you can't trace God's hand, you can trust God's heart. I'm going to say that again. When you can't trace God's hand, you can trust God's heart. He will always accomplish the purposes that he set out to. He is the sovereign God of the universe. He's never, ever failed or dropped the ball. He's never spending any time drinking Maalox to settle down his stomach because he's distressed over the situation. He's never had an ulcer or high blood pressure because our God is the sovereign God and he's going to walk with us even through the darkest and hardest of times. Now, there they are. They feel trapped. They're looking around thinking, Moses, did you take us out here to let us die at Pharaoh's hands? Did you give, give us a false hope so that you could then just wipe us out out here in the wilderness? And so you felt that way before. So we're going to work our way through this concept. You are where you are because God wants you to be there. And he's going to use the current circumstances and the current situation to develop you into a, into a strong, vibrant dynamic child of God. Now, listen to what Spurgeon said. He said, that, that which like a sea threatens to drown you shall be your highway for your escape, because God can make a way where there is no way. He can cause streams to be in the desert, and he can cause a highway in the sea. He can make a way where there is no physical human possibility of hope or help. He, he, um, he thrives in the midst of problems. You have never seen a miracle take place that wasn't preceded by a profound problem. And those profound problems are the arenas in which God gets great glory. And that's what he says here. He says, I'm going to get great glory on Pharaoh. Pharaoh was one of those individuals that, that was essentially claiming to be deity because he was the ruler of a nation. Just because you're a ruler of a nation don't mean you're a deity. He didn't have he didn't have a, a God status, and so God's going to show him who God really is. And Pharaoh's going to learn that day who God really is. But the Israelites are going to go through an uncomfortable, worrisome time because they don't know yet that they can trust in God. But indeed, they can because God can make a highway of escape in the midst of what seems to be hopeless and helpless. Now let's talk about worry. Have you ever worried? John R. Rice said, worry is putting a question mark where God put an exclamation point. Worry is putting a question mark where God put an exclamation point. God wants to straighten out our question marks and uh, turn them into exclamation marks. He wants to cause us not to live in that place of fear, fearfulness and fretfulness, and he wants us to move into a place of faithfulness where we're obeying God, because he said to do it, and he knows what he's doing, and he's going to get us all the way through. Look, God has got you successfully through every problem you've ever been in, or you wouldn't be here watching this video right now. God's success rate is 100% in your life. He's taken care of you and brought you where you need to be, and he's going to take care of you until he calls you away home. He hasn't somehow uh, faltered or failed. Fulton J. Sheen said, Worry is a form of atheism, for it betrays a lack of faith and trust in God. Whenever I'm worrying, I'm saying, God, you're not big enough. God, you're not strong enough. God, you don't know enough. God, you're not enough. But God is enough, and I need to remind myself of that, and you need to remind yourself of that so that you and I can find strength to help us in that time of need. So the Lord tests our faith. He allows us to come into hardships in specific areas. Ever had a bad diagnosis from a doctor? Where the doctor said, I'm sorry, I want you to come in. We need to talk. Or you got a pink slip in your inbox and you found out you were laid off and you are gonna didn't know when you are going to be brought back on. Or maybe you found yourself agonizing over struggles with your children and you got some prodigals that are running hard from God, headed hard or wrong direction that you know is going to be harmful to them and you desperately want to intervene but you know that you've got to cast them on God and trust God to carry them where they need to be. Um, I mean, on and on, a, a troubled marriage? I mean, what do you have that is this Red Sea moment for you where you find yourself up against something not of your own choosing that you would never have chosen, 
but God is going to move in it in a powerful way. Let me, let me take you through some people in the Bible who were at one of these crossroads, one of these uh, devil in the deep blue sea kind of things. Hagar found herself forced into the desert to die with her child. She had nothing. And God meets her, sends an angelic presence to her, and promises her that he's going to take care of her. And not only is she going to live, but her children are going to become nations. And then, or Joseph, who sold into slavery in Egypt by his brothers, absolutely rejected by the people who should have loved him, who should have cared for him as, as his older siblings. And instead, he's beaten, cast into a pit, sold into slavery by his brothers. Ultimately, by the end of the story, He's the second most powerful man on the planet. Or you might look at Moses, who uh, caught between the splendors of Egyptian royalty and the afflictions of God's people, ends up becoming a fugitive and spends four decades in the backside of the wilderness before God calls him to be the deliverer of the children of Israel. But he goes through this time where he's up against the devil in the deep blue sea. Hezekiah was seeking revival. He was trapped by the most powerful army on earth, bent on annihilating his people, and God supernaturally moved to deliver his people without them having to fight at all, merely through the weapon of praise. David, anointed by Samuel, and then pursued by the Israelite troops. He's told he's going to be the king, and then the king, who's still the king, is chasing him, trying to kill him because of a bitter jealousy in his heart and an evil demonic spirit that's controlling him. And ultimately, though, David is not only the king, but he's the best king that Israel would ever have. The Lord's disciples sailed at his command out into the Sea of Galilee only to face a terror-filled night on the, of a storm and out on the waves. And God speaks peace and everything calms down. He comes walking to them on top of the stormy waters. The, the Son of Man, seeking to fulfill his Father's will, is killed on a cross, and yet he's resurrected the third day, ascended to heaven where he ever liveth to make intercession for us. The apostles whipped and, and, and uh, murdered for preaching the truth of Jesus Christ, but they turned the whole world upside down with that preaching. Jesus said, In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. That's a good P.S. I have overcome the world. God allows our faith to be tried. Remember that God has put us in difficult situation or has allowed us to be there sometimes for reasons known only to himself. You are there by God's appointment. Whether you are in a bad situation because of your own mistakes or sins, God wants you to be there because he's going to teach you something. Now, I'm not saying that God made the this made you sin we chose our own mess but god wants to teach you something in the midst of the mess see it says god works all things together for good to them that love him and are called according to his purpose romans 8 28 and that means even the bad things god works them together for good things because that's how sovereign he is now, he doesn't make men sin he doesn't make pharaohs chase armies just at some some whim that he has but God is going to take the bad and turn it into something amazing as you and I learn the lessons we're supposed to learn. So what we often want to do is we want to, well, think of your the dashboard in your car. The oil light comes on and you, uh, you look at it and you go, oh, that's a, that's a problem. And so, you're temp so you want to somehow disable the oil light so that red light's not bothering you while you're driving. Now, what you're supposed to do is learn the lesson of the oil light, put oil in the car so that it won't burn up the engine and you won't have to buy another car. But what a fool would do is take a little hammer, a ball-peen hammer, break out the oil light and say, there, it's not bothering me anymore. And that's what we want to do with our circumstances. When the circumstances are blaring, you need to turn to God. You need to take action. You need to trust God right now. And, and the fool says, I don't want to be in this circumstance. I, I, I don't want to be where I'm at. And we try to break it and we try to stop that warning that God is giving us. So God is trying to teach us a series of lessons using our current circumstances as his classroom, teaching tremendous tribulation truth to us so that you and I will learn. I'll tell you what, the truths that I've learned in the hard times in my life are the things that have stood by me forever. I mean, they, they stuck with me. But the things that I pick up along the way when everything's rosy and hunky-dory and I kind of stumble across the truth in the Bible, I can barely remember it. But boy, when you get trauma truth, you remember it.
And, and once you learn the lesson, then you're able to advance to a different situation so that you don't have to be in that situation anymore. You, you move from one grade level to another grade level. Now, there'll be other issues there, but it won't be the same issue. It won't be a Pharaoh issue. It won't be a Red Sea issue. It'll be something else that you face down the road, but God will teach you a truth there. And then you advance, and then you advance, and you advance. And you move from faith to faith. I hope that makes sense. Hey, let's pray. I'm going to pray for you in the midst of your devil in the deep blue sea moment. Dear God, I pray that you'd be with these dear ones under the sound of my voice. I know that they love you. I know that their desire is to please you. I pray that you would be with them in this moment in time. God, I do not know what is causing them to cry into their pillow at night, but I know that you do. I do not know what causes a ache in their heart right now, but I know that you do. I, Lord, I pray that you would move in a profound way. You have the ability to reach down and, and touch us in those areas of grave need and bring about life. You can cause the mantle of heaviness to be cast off for the garment of praise. Give us the ability to be able to worship you, to praise you, because we trust you to know what you're doing in the midst of our devil in the deep blue sea moment. Give us your strength, God. Help us to remember that we are where we are for your purposes, and you're going to grow us into the men and women that we need to be. In Jesus' most holy, precious, and powerful name, amen. Hey, God bless you. Thank you for tuning in.